Now testing, now testing. One, two, three. Now, now testing. Now, now testing. One, two, three, four, five. And Mr. Chair, the meeting is live. Great. Good afternoon, and welcome to the Joint Public Works and Transportation Committee. Uh, I'm joined by my colleagues on the Public Works Committee, uh, Con Council Member O'Farrell, De Leon, and Coretz. Mr. Lee is absent. We are also joined by the Transportation Committee uh, that is chaired by uh, Councilmember Bonin, and he is joined by Councilmembers Buscaino and Mr. Coretz, who is doing double duty on, on both committees. So he gets to vote twice. Um, so this is a one agenda item meeting, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll move into public comments. Uh, unless any of the, uh, my colleagues or Mr. Chair of the Transportation Committee wants to say anything at the beginning, we can move into public comment. Also, or anyone else? Mr. Chair, would you like me to call the roll in both meetings? Well, that's a very good point. Thank you for that reminder, Mr. Espinosa. So let's, let's do that. So this is for the Public Works Committee. Council Member Blumenfield? Blumenfield present. Council Member Lee? Council Member De Leon? Present. Council Member O'Farrell? Aye. Council present. <laughs> Council Member Coretz? Present. Yes, yeah, so for the Public Works Committee, we have four out of five members and a quorum. Now for the Transportation Committee, Council Member Bonin. Present. Council Member Coretz. Present. And Council Member Buscano. Here and I. Thank you. All three members are present and a quorum for transportation as well. Great. Mr. Bonin, do you want to say anything before public before we do public comment? Uh, no, let's dive right in. Thank you. Great. All right, then. Um, Speaker's going to have a minute to speak on the item. Uh, because this is a special meeting, we're not going to have general public comment. Uh, Mr. Espinosa, would you provide the information, phone number, instructions, et cetera? Yes, Mr. Chair. Members of the public who would like to offer public comment on the items listed on the agenda should call 1-669-254-5252 and use meeting ID number 160-073-2397 and then press pound. Press pound again when prompted for a participant ID. Once admitted into the meeting, press star nine to speak. Great, do we have a queue of folks? Good afternoon members. We have five people in the queue for public comment. Uh, first caller with the last four digits, two, five, six, eight. Please unmute yourself and begin. You have 60 seconds. Caller 2568. Please unmute yourself. Okay, we'll. Go to the next caller. Caller, last four digits, 4302. Please unmute yourself. Caller, 
Caller, last four digits, 4302. And for the public comments, uh, public callers, you need to star six to unmute. You want to try to run through that again? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Please identify yourself. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Uh, my name is uh, Tim Harder. I'm a regional senior manager with Bird. Okay. You may begin. You have 60 seconds. Uh, I'd like to thank you for providing the opportunity to provide public comment this afternoon. Uh, Bird was founded here in 2017. We have operational experience in LA ever since, from a conditional use permit to a pilot permit to extensions, and now to an annualized permit program under leadership from Cancel. Together, we have built one of the most successful microbility programs in the world. With millions of trips completed in the first iteration of the program, resulting in offsetting thousands of metric tons of CO2, this program has been a massive success toward mode shifts, supporting the local economy and making the city more livable. Issues seen in the early days of microbility around 31 tickets is, has been decreasing over time. With the new programming coming online, Bird will present a few items throughout today's public comment to address that we believe will vastly improve the, the program. We fundamentally believe that 3,500 vehicles per an operator won't create a robust enough system to continue the trend of mode shift and will stop the success of the first program. What the report should have mentioned was that Bird and other operators have maintained the maximum fleet in the LA Basin and would very well to have more vehicles in the area. Out of transparency, Bird's current fleet is lower than the 5,500 as we utilize the last three month extension to bring the cost of our fleet down due to winter months and surging COVID. We anticipate peak ridership going into the warmer months and even the four, former 5,500 in the basin would not meet the anticipated demand we expect to see in 2021. With the program's you, revenue streams high to rise and ride, right? our concern is that the longevity program is under threat because of an arbitrary limited fleet. We ask that you reconsider this ask. Thank you. Okay, next caller, uh, last four digits, 7050. Please unmute yourself and identify yourself. Can you confirm you can hear me? We can. Awesome, Morgan Roth also with Bird Scooters. Um, we very much uh, look forward to the new program with it a number of changes that will reshape the availability of micro mobility throughout the city. The equity portion of this program has a goal of building out a network of micromobility options to residents throughout the city, but as of now, it currently does not have enough incentive to truly hit those targets. One area we believe should be looked at to immediately improve distribution and ultimately help achieve this goal is the overall percentages of vehicles deployed to the EF MDDSs and MDDs for access to operation in the special operations zone. To ensure a wider spread of vehicles throughout the city to achieve true equitable fleet distribution, we believe that council should increase uh, and consider a 20% deployment requirement to the MDDs along with the 5% requirement already to the EFMDD. This means that minimum 25% of all operator fleets would be distributed to areas of need. In addition to increasing the fleet distribution, we believe that council should consider a ratio system of three to one equity to SOZ deployment um, where an operator with 150 vehicles in the Venice SOZ would be required to have at least 450 vehicles out in the two equity zones. With a policy like this in place, council will ensure that Venice doesn't get oversaturated and equity continues to be the number one priority of the program. Thank we you. believe that the new program map and payment structure have fundamentally reshaped how vehicles are distributed. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. The next caller with the Last four digits, one, four, seven, four. Please unmute yourself. One, four, seven, four. Press star six to unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? We can. Please identify yourself. Great, thank you. Yeah, good afternoon. Michael Shulstone with Central City Association. CCA is supportive of micromobility and believes dockless vehicles are an important transportation mode, especially for short trips in dense neighborhoods like downtown LA. Much of downtown is in a designated special operating zone where there's high demand for dockless scooters and bikes, but often oversaturation and other challenges. We ask that the city consider not allowing new operators to serve these zones until at least one year after joining the city's program. We also encourage this joint committee to consider the insurance requirements imposed on operators. Operators must insure scooters and bikes at five times the level of coverage that the city's shared car program requires. 
We encourage the city's program's insurance requirements to be consistent with other cities like Denver and Washington, D.C. that match car rental insurance requirements. Finally, we ask this joint committee to provide guidance to DOT for how to invest any program revenue into improving mobility infrastructure across the city. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next caller with the last four digits, 2568. Please unmute yourself by pressing star six. Can you hear me? We can. Go ahead. Awesome. Thank you for the opportunity to provide public comment this afternoon. My name is Guranj Singh, and I'm Bird Senior Ops Associate leading our LA fleet and operations. Bird looks forward to continuing to partner with the city into the years to come, and I hope that council will consider some of the recommendations made by my Bird colleagues earlier in public comment. With new operators interested in operating in the city, we request that the city council look at implementing a moratorium on new operators from deploying into the most sensitive areas of the city, namely Venice Beach, Hollywood, and downtown LA. Collectively, the current operators have spent millions of dollars, thousands of hours in engineering and field time, and have held many meetings with community groups to ensure that we meet the demands of these zones. Potential new operators will have done none of this in advance. With the potential for an unlimited number of new operators coming into the program as soon as next month, we do not feel there are sufficient safeguards in place to ensure that Venice, Hollywood, and downtown are maintained as those new operators come online. Unless other measures are put in place, as my colleagues offered before, hundreds of scooters could be deployed to Venice and Hollywood in mere weeks. It's critical that we support this program and continue to build on the success of our existing program. We strongly recommend that the city council reconsider the lowering of caps, increase the equity threshold, require MDS agency compliance for all operators, and place a moratorium on new operators from deploying into the most sensitive areas of the city. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. The next caller is uh, last four digits, 9485. Please unmute yourself. Again, last four digits, 9485. Please press star six to unmute yourself. Last chance. Call over the last four digits, 9485. Please, please press star six to unmute yourself if you wish to speak. Okay, Mr. Chair, that concludes public comment. Sorry, I was on mute. Did, did we go back the around to the early ones that didn't respond. I just want to make sure we don't miss anybody for a technical reason. Um, we did. Oh, okay. There, uh, there may be one more, one more commenter that just raised their hand. Oh, okay, great. The present opportunity. Last four digits, 8026. Yes, hello, can you hear me? We can. Great. So, hello, my name is Colin Hughes, and I'm the Senior Policy Manager for New Mobility with Lyft, Bikes, and Scooters. And I first just want to thank the city and LADOT for working with us on our concerns to craft a better micromobility program. Uh, Lyft has added our letter to the council file, but I just want to highlight two core issues for us uh, today. Uh, the first is that LA's insurance requirements for scooters are the highest in the country um, alongside Santa Monica. These insurance requirements are three to five times higher than what is required for a shared car in Los Angeles and limit Lyft's ability to compete with cars and weaken our ability to invest in meeting the other goals of the city, like providing more equitable service. We're asking that City Council and LADOT adopt the state of California's insurance guidelines for micromobility at $1 million per occurrence and $5 million in aggregate. The second issue I wanted to talk about is uh, that we support the suggested fleet cap at 3,500 vehicles, um, and the council should only allow that to be increased if operators can prove that they have sufficient demand in their fleet uh, for three or more trips per vehicle per day. Otherwise, uh, this just, if, if there isn't demand to meet an increased supply, we just have unused scooters occupying public space and upsetting the public. Um, so thank you very much for working with us. Uh, we value the partnership we've built with council and with LADOT through the first pilot program. And we are looking forward to working with you all on a successful uh, second version. Thank you. Thank you. 
There's one more caller we should give one more opportunity to. Last four digits, 9485. If you're there, yes. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Go ahead. Good afternoon. My name is Alyssa on behalf of Lyme. I want to thank the committees for allowing me to speak today. Lyme is proud to serve the city of Los Angeles during the pilot program and appreciates our partnership that we have formed since 2018. The recent LADOT staff report proposed new zones that are improved from the old equity maps. And we encourage the city to consider increasing the 5% deployment requirement in the EFMDD zone to 10% in order to help the city meet their equity goals. We ask also that the city maintain current fleet caps of 5,500 vehicles. The, the proposal of the 3,500 3, vehicles is made during the summer at the height of COVID, dealing, a height of the city dealing with COVID. We want to ensure that LA leads the way to economic recovery. We are not limiting access to an essential transportation option for our, our Angelinos which will also inevitably impact equity deployment. The city of Los Angeles has set a policy goal for scooter transportation, which is to provide a reliable transit mode for the entire city. We ask and look for the new program, Lime hopes that the city stands behind and promotes transportation equality for all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, now that concludes public comment. Great. All right, then. Um, we will move now to a presentation by DOT. I think we have a few folks from DOT who will be presenting. And you know, I, see, I see our general manager is here. I didn't realize you were presenting, so even better. So, Salita, the floor is yours, and you can, you can delegate to uh, your staff as appropriate. So, welcome. Great. Thank you very much, council members. Uh, and thanks for, for giving us the time we needed to weed through some of the questions that you posed when we brought the uh, rules and regulations to you last summer. I think that what we have to share with you today uh, represents um, you know, something that's very responsive to some of the questions and concerns you had. It also represents a lot of work that Jarvis Murray and his team have been doing with the operators because our goal here really, our, our sort of you know, North Star is that we're trying to continue to expand and maximize the number of choices that Angelinos have to get around the city. So that the default is not always to get into a car, especially to make short trips. So our goal here is to find win-wins, uh, wins for people walking, wins for neighborhoods, wins for uh, new businesses, and wins for people who, who need it and, and want a different way of, of getting around. So just a, a recap, last summer we brought y'all the, the program evaluation and a series of recommendations. And at that time, uh, you and your colleagues on council approved our recommendations to um, focus on a, a, a mobility program that was healthy, transparent, and equitable, safety focused, clean and resilient, um, and uh, to create an open marketplace that fosters innovation um, and workforce development uh, and, and jobs. So we had baseline requirements for insurance and indemnity, we had fleet caps, we had a new enforcement schedule, and we had a more dynamic fee structure to better reflect demand. Uh, and what y'all asked us to do um, was to, to revise the incentivized deployment zones and the associated fees. So, you know, really the punchline was in our initial program, um, we had created an incentive-based structure to um, try and nudge operators to deploy equitably across the city, uh, and that didn't work. And so we came back with a, a little bit um, stronger stance on that that includes a mix of incentives and requirements um, to make sure that if you are serving some of the most trip-rich areas of the city, that you're also serving um, parts of the city that did not get uh, access to, to this, um, this new mode of getting around um, during the pilot. So what we did is created, um, I think, four different zones. So the first one is a mobility development district. So these are parts of the city where we did not see extensive deployment first time around, um, but they're places where there's infrastructure and where when you look at how people are traveling in those districts, they're making a lot of short trips um, that would, some of which would lend themselves to um, uh, personal mobi on-demand mobility devices like scooters or bikes. Um, there are also areas that maybe have a lower crash rate, they're, they're generally safer, they have infrastructure. Um, so we reduced fees in some of these areas to try and incentivize more deployment. Then we have equity focused mobility development districts, which are just like uh, mobility development districts, but they also have, um, there are also parts of the city where people are experiencing economic hardship. So there's no trip fee for deployment in these areas. 
Then there are special operation zones, which are places where we see um, saturation and potentially even a tendency for oversaturation, along with the presence of other um, sensitive uses. So think, you know, the Venice canals or um, the historic uh, Hollywood Walk of Fame. Then there are, there's the rest of the city um, that are not captured in these distinct areas um, that have a base per trip fee and follow the standard rules and guidelines. So that's what we're, um, we're bringing back to you today. We would also um, request the opportunity to come back to you uh, with a parking infrastructure plan because we still believe firmly that the ultimate requirement of a lock two device on these um, scooters and bikes is what's going to lead to the best outcomes when we think about um, an orderly and equitable public realm. So making sure that sidewalks are clear, uh, making sure that um, things are, are have a, every, everything has a place to go. Um, so we understand the concerns about requiring a lock two device uh, when we haven't um, created sort of that extensive parking infrastructure. So we would really like to, to bring that back to you at some point in the future. Um, and with that, uh, I think Jarvis Murray, who is the for hire administrator, is here um, to answer any questions that y'all have or uh, make any other framing comments. Jarvis, do you want to add anything? Um, yes, the only thing I would add is that I'd like to actually commend many of the operators for being engaged in this process. Um, we tried to speak to them as much as possible as we put these things together, and we actually gave them a little bit of the burden of helping us figure out what are some programs that will be helpful um, in the community. And I've, I'm getting a great sense from many of the providers that they also wanna be very much a part of this community and not just here um, simply to make money. So I, I just wanna commend them for doing that. And that's all I wanted to add at this stage. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, I know members have questions and I know some folks have some uh, recommendations, including myself, but. Uh, I'll get us started on the questions. Um, I'll start with um, one of the big concerns that came up last time. And, and by the way, before I say that, I, I do want to commend uh, you, Ms. Reynolds, and the, and the department. Uh, I think you guys have really uh, done yeoman's work on this in putting together what is a, a new and complex uh, challenge and, and coming up with, with creative ways to incentivize and distribute the uh, the mobility devices throughout the city. And yes, you'll definitely have the opportunity to come back to talk about the lock two devices and other things, because this is, this is something that is a work in progress. Um, but, but I feel like we're making really good progress, but I did want to start with, uh, with that bit of appreciation. Uh, and then to move to a couple of questions. So one of the biggest concerns that came up last time was the equity map. And I think the, the new map, the current map is much better than the previous map. So what was the new criteria that you used that made this different? Go ahead, Jarvis. Oh, thank you. Um, so we actually used several different things. And actually, I would like to ask um, our Karina Macias, um, who also helped us engage. She's in the transportation planning department to talk through some of the criteria, as well as uh, some of the underlying uh, issues and things that she saw in helping us put together these new zones and these new maps. Thanks for that, Jarvis. Uh, good afternoon, uh, council members. I'm Karina Macias and served as the analytics lead this time around uh, to kind of help define some, a set of geographies um, that both combined uh, a set of metrics related to community level characteristics. I know that uh, last time a piece of feedback was that the sense of block group was a little too micro uh, to really help folks understand the, the um, characteristics. Um, so what we did this time is we took the neighborhood council um, level and then took a look at um, the quality of transit available, shared modes such as bike share and car share in each of these communities, um, as well as the, as uh, General Manager Reynolds alluded to, the average distance of trips that folks within those geographies were taking um, to identify those mobility development districts first. So those are places where uh, folks would experience fear crashes and um, a high number of shared mobility choices and have short trips. 
so converting them to a dockless bike or scooter would be really simple or would be an easier choice to make. And then we, we knew that we wanted to understand um, where ec socioeconomic equity needs were the greatest to really leverage the income conscious um, and, and other equity programs that uh, the operators created. So those, that's where we looked at economic hardship, um, where it intersects with mobility development districts. So those are places where folks are already traveling short distances, but households are more likely than in other parts of the city to experience um, lower incomes, uh, unemployment rates, and lower uh, or higher, uh, lower educational attainment. So those are places where the operators um, would, would have to uh, go a little further to, to then uh, activate those, those programs. And then the standard permit districts are places where um, it, the, the suitability of, the, of dockless mobility modes as we know them today um, wasn't really popping up because um, those economic equity access, comfort, and perceived safety factors we're, we're missing. I hope that answers your question. Oh, it I does. I, I do appreciate that. And I think it's important also the public to know that when we lower our fee in this area, then that ideally, while the person, the user may not notice that on the ground, but that incentivizes these companies to, to focus on getting scooters into underserved areas. But I think that was, you guys did well on that. I, I did want to also ask about the cap. Um, how did DOT come up with the 3,500 vehicle cap? What, uh, that one didn't make a lot of sense to me. I mean, we were at a higher cap already, and so I'm not sure why we're going down. And, and, and for example, what is the size of the largest fleet that's currently deployed now? Well, currently the fleets, uh, we haven't had a deployment of over 6,000 vehicles um, so far. So this is including during the pilot program. During the pilot program, we had a minimum of 10,500 vehicles, and at no point did any of our providers exceed that amount. So when we did take a look um, at the fleet cap, we looked at it at, you know, during the pilot program, and we based it upon you know, using incentives to help us increase ridership in other areas. So one of the things we wanted to ensure was you know, not an influx of oversaturation, but also a method of giving, essentially giving the operator something to strive for uh, if they wanted to increase their fleets. Um, but in terms of the actual performance of each fleet, no fleet has, uh, to this point, exceed, exceeded 6,000 vehicles. Right, although if we're proposing 3,500 as a cap, then we're, we're, we're cutting off uh, folks in terms of we're lowering the amount that they may already have in the field. That would be correct. Yeah, and I, I don't understand the logic behind that. Like, why would we want to do that? I mean, we, we want to incentivize folks to, uh, and I like the incentives that we have, the percentages, and, and, and we could, you know, even increase those. But but the the goal is to get underserved areas uh, access to mobility devices. So if we're if we're cutting the the number down drastically, how does that help do that? If I could just up, um, just uh, make one correction, the the base was always 3,500, so we just kept it the same. Uh, operators had incentives to go above that, uh, or the cap, sorry. Um, they had incentives to go above that, so that's why some of them made it up to 6,000. Um, and so that was, we just, we just kept it the same. We brought over the same number from the pilot because it seemed to work for everybody the first time around. I understand that now, um, you know, the operators are feeling uh, maybe a little bit more bullish. Maybe they want to have a, a higher cap. And I think that's something that we would be, we're, we're happy to work with that um, because it was adopted as part of the core rules and regs last time. Um, we would just need an, uh, a, an amendment um, in order to do that. So, so that's why we kept, we just sort of brought it over and kept it the same because to be honest, the first go round during the pilot um, you know, people exceeding that 10,500 wasn't a, wasn't a, wasn't an issue. Like nobody ever sniffed it. Nobody ever got close. And so when we looked at um, that, we thought, well, this isn't really an issue for the industry anymore. Nobody at that time was requesting or asking for that. So we just kept it the same and carried it over. Um, to be honest, just because it seemed to work first time around. 
but that's something that we're we're open to adjusting. Because the but do the incentives still exist? Yes. Yes. The the incentives definitely still exist. So if the incentives still exist, I don't know. It seems to me that we're artificially cutting it, cutting the number down as opposed to just rolling the number over. Because in the past, with the incentives, you could get up to six thousand, and now you can only get up to thirty five hundred. Would, do you see a problem with raising it, raising it up back to where we were at, which is the, depending on how you define it, the fifty five hundred or the six thousand? Um, I think we probably want to have still have some room to play with for performance based incentives, but we can have the that initial cap set at a higher level. I think that's what you're asking for. Instead of saying everybody can have thirty five hundred. And then if you deploy in some of these equity zones, then you can continue to increase your overall cap. We're saying everybody can have 5,000, 6,000, something like that. But I would still recommend that we keep some performance-based incentives included in the program so that we still have that. What we had last time were carrots, no sticks. Right. This time we have, we're trying to bring both. So I think what you're saying is why can't we just raise that initial cap um, and I think we're saying that's something that we're we're certainly open to that that would be fine, but I would love to still have a little room to play with to include those performance based incentives. So I wouldn't, for example, recommend that we start with a baseline cap of 10,000 vehicles, for instance, maybe a baseline cap of six might make sense, and then we can still have performance based incentives included. Great. I, I mean, that's I'm interested to hear what my colleagues think, but I think that's that's a logical place to land, which is keep the performance based, but, but set the cap at six, 6,000. Yeah. And that way nobody ends up having to have less because we, we want, we want this incentive to go out to the different, to be able to serve Canoga park in my district and to be able to serve other areas throughout the city. Uh, and as long as we have those other incentives in there, the caps, I mean, the percentages and everything else, then that's going to yeah. force folks. Um, I would agree. I would, I would also say I'm a little more comfortable with that this go round just because we also have, we're not relying purely on incentives. We have requirements this time as well. Right. And speaking of that, how, how did DOT come up with the 5% uh, as the percentage that must be deployed in the equity zone? Again, that was a number that was helped to, that our consultants helped us put together and it was based upon ridership uh, in the area. So most of these zones that we are requesting the 5% in have virtually no ridership or not ridership, but no deployment, uh, excuse me. And so because of that lack of deployment, we wanted to do something that would still push deployment in the area, but not uh, push it in a way that operationally wouldn't be feasible for um, for the companies. So, um, you know, to the extent that there's a, you know, an alternative, we're, you know, interested in hearing those things, but, um, but that's how we set it. All right, I'm going to go now to um, I've got additional questions, but I want to keep the keep the conversation flowing and let my colleagues and, and start on starting off with my the, the chair of the Transportation Committee, uh, Mr. Bonin, go ahead. Ed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bloomfield, and thank you for, for running the show today. Um, uh, I'm glad we're finally at this point. You know, I have not been the biggest cheerleader for uh, the dockless scooters in the city, nor have I been uh, the biggest opponent. I've been sort of in the middle. Uh, and I've experienced the benefits and I've experienced the drawbacks. You know, the, the scooters landed on LA streets really without any warning and without any rules in place. And we really had to, to scramble to, to respond to, to this disruptive technology. And, and I gotta say, I wanna thank Salida and, and Jarvis and LA DOT I think they've really done a, a pretty damn good job of seeing seeing the opportunity that these devices have presented for achieving our mobility and our environmental goals, while at the same time really thinking long term about how we should regulate potentially new and disruptive technology on our streets. And I think it's important as we have this discussion that we acknowledge that this isn't just about scooters. This is the, the framework here. Um, uh, you know, it's a roadmap for imp implementing regulations of all kinds on potential new technologies from drones to, to AVs to TNCs, God willing, we ever get the authority to do that. Um, and we have to ensure that this framework works citywide and anticipates the, the future. So I want to give LADOT kudos for, for 
I, I think it was a very serious and, and thorough and thoughtful evaluation of the pilot program. Um, I think the findings are of their evaluation are appropriately critical where the program fell short. And I, and I really love that they proposed concrete solutions to those issues. Um, and I think the, the evidence is, is, the evaluation really is evidence that the DOT is, is, is really a responsible regulator for, for micromobility. Um, now, like all of us, I continue to get a lot of complaints about issues with the program, but I, I, I want to just give DOT a shout out. I think they have been really responsive and they continue to fine tune the special operations zone where, where I have the most issues in CD11 in Venice. Uh, which really became the, the, the capital of scooter glut uh, for a while until DOT helped us out. And, and so I want to thank them for that continuous work. Um, I, I really like the look of the new equity and mobility districts. I love that we have the, the equity, the mobility, um, and, 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 um, and the special operations district. And I think they're pretty thoughtfully designed and make a lot of sense to people. Um, you know, one of my issues from the very beginning I mean, God, it was years ago now when this first came to T committee, was um, uh, the the the, re the requirement that we be operating in in these other areas, not just in the places like Venice that were sort of where where the market wanted to be. And I was very particularly concerned. It was a sort of a, a discussion that both me and Ms. Martinez had when she was on the committee with us here about the importance of, of, of equity in this program. And um, I, I'm, I'm glad that we've moved from not just incentives because they weren't working, um, but I'd like to see us uh, go stronger. And I'd like to see a required deployment of 20% in equity districts for those companies to operate in special operation zones. You want to operate in Venice, you got to be able to do 20% in the equity areas. Um, and, and I feel really, really strongly about that. Um, I, 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 I guess I concur with Mr. Blumenfield on the, the, the cap. I'd be okay with uh, uh, doing the 6,000 uh, uh, and knowing that the general manager has the discretion and the rules as we've built in um, to, to examine performance targets and, 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 uh, and, and using her discretion to grandfather in the larger fleets. I think the 6,000 makes sense just based on Ms. Ms. Reynolds' comments. So. Um, uh, I'd, uh, I'd move we require the, the equity to be 20% uh, for companies that choose to operate in the special ops zones, and I would also move the, the, the 6,000 cap as Mr. Uh, Blumenfield. Second, Second that. Great. And, and we'll, we'll, I'm not, we're not going to vote on any of the motions until the end. I mean, you telegraph it, that's fine, and we'll take them all up. I'll, I'll try to keep track of them all uh, if, if more come up, but let's, let's, this way we can have a full discussion. But, uh, but great. Appreciate that, and um, I didn't mean to cut you off. Any additional comments, Mr. Bonner? No, that was it. Okay, great. And then the next one, I'm going in the order that I saw the hands. It goes to uh, Mr. Koretz, who gets uh, who's on both committees, so he's doing double questioning. So, Mr. Koretz. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm happy to do uh, twice as many questions as everybody else, uh, based on my uh, double representation. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Bonin seems to be reacting negatively to that, but uh, I will point out that uh, I'm probably less of a fan of scooters than Mr. Bonin, as he realizes by uh, my time on, uh, on, on T committee. Um, but I have a few questions. Uh, one is uh, there's a large swath of CD5, uh, effectively the southern part of the district, that would be a designated a mobility uh, development district. But this portion of the district actually varies in terms of income levels and travel times and access to bicycle infrastructure and transit and crash rates. So can you walk us through the methodology used to designate mo mobility uh, development districts and how those geographies were determined? Sure, I can kind of begin the conversation, but um, I think uh, Karina Macias can join in and, and give more details, uh, particularly how um, how the underlying uh, engine under the hood works. But the way that it was really determined is, again, we looked at uh, numerous factors, including travel times and, and infrastructure that's already in place. And so basically 
what we saw in those areas is that there is some infrastructure in place that would make ridership in those areas somewhat comfortable for the average user. And while uh, it's not completely uh, economically disadvantaged, we wanted to uh, incentivize ridership in areas that felt comfortable because again, that's a lot of the feedback that we received that, you know, our original maps included areas that were not the kind of places where anyone would feel safe riding. And even our providers pointed out that it's it's not the right type of area in many cases. But as we've redone these maps and, and talked to the providers about them, this is much more indicative of what would be something that is workable and that would allow people to, you know, if they're deployed, to be able to use them and use them in an appropriate way. Uh, Karina, is there more that you can add to that? Yeah, so the, the only thing I would add is that we, we were relying, we are relying on neighborhood council boundaries system as a way to tap into the existing community or neighborhood empowerment infrastructure that the city has. Um, so if largely each of these designations represents what type of characteristics dominate that neighborhood council boundary um, in, in when it comes to what a dockless mobility user would would feel suitable and comfortable traveling within. Um, but there are going to be instances where perhaps a couple of blocks within a neighborhood council don't feel like the overall designation. Um, and I, I think that that's okay because the designations are, are really rooted towards uh, per trip pricing. So naturally the consumer will avoid blocks within the, the neighborhood council designation that don't you know, suit their needs. Um, but this really just points to what per trip rate would be applied. Okay, thank you. And, and uh, I mean, most of my concerns with scooters uh, have been uh, safety issues, uh, one of which is uh, underage riding, which continues to be an issue much less than before because every issue is less than before because during the pandemic, uh, we see a lot less ridership. And uh, particularly, I, I can't tell whether the nature of my neighborhood, uh, which I can only look at anecdotally, I'm not seeing scooters strewn around everywhere and people tripping over them and all the other problems. But I think also it's, it may be because uh, uh, school is, has been remote. So I think a lot of people have moved out of my neighborhood that are attending colleges and live there uh, when they had to go in person. But uh, first, the underage uh, question. Um, I know council attempted to address the issue by requiring a valid driver's license, first to be uploaded and then to be regularly uploaded. And uh, the report cites privacy concerns as why this isn't required. Um, I know at least one company did this for a time. Um, didn't have any problems with it. So uh, why are we so concerned about not uploading uh, every once in a while as opposed to just uploading once? What's the difference in privacy? Well, from our perspective, and I, I think it's important to note that we haven't necessarily ruled the issue out. It's more a, a, a policy of wanting to get it right. And, you know, for us, you know, the privacy concern you know, is a legitimate concern. And we want to make sure that, you know, whatever we are doing, because the providers them, themselves collect, you know, a ton of information and data that we don't necessarily want and or need. Uh, to the extent that we want and or need this type of information, again, we want to set a policy that is, that is correct and that will work. Uh, and right now, you know, we haven't yet found the right policy uh, to do that uh, in a way that, um, that really protects the public uh, in a strong way. So that's that's really where we are right now. Well, I'd certainly encourage us to take a good long look at how we can do that in the future. Um, I'm also wondering how we can incentivize or if we're willing to incentivize good behavior. For instance, uh, I know the technology has been developed uh, that can identify uh, using uh, gyroscopic technology whether a bicycle is standing up or not and leaving bicycles strewn across the sidewalk for people to trip over in the dark um, has been a safety problem. Uh, is there any reason why we're not uh, 
trying to incentivize that good behavior in that sense, or, or are we? Um, we are definitely trying to incentivize that behavior. That is actually one of the, the things that uh, a company can do to increase their fleet, for example. So we've, you know, we included technological advances, and I do know that some of the companies are beginning to work on different things, and in particular, um, sidewalk uh, guidance systems, you know, to ensure or, or to learn about sidewalk riding and, and ways to try to help prevent sidewalk riding. So as those companies begin pushing those things forward and implementing them and begin testing them, we absolutely, uh, as a regulatory body, would be incentivizing uh, whether they needed to increase their fleet or, um, you know, reduce, uh, you know, their fleet in other ways. We'd be able to do that based upon them changing or increasing the technological advances for their fleet. So we, that is something that we definitely want to encourage, uh, and we're always looking for ways to, um, you know, to change what what they have to manage if they're going to be doing things that are better for the city. And are we incentivizing or looking to incentivize helmet riding? Because uh, I, I know anecdotally, again, the the few people that I think really were regularly using scooters first and last mile to work. Um, some of them were bringing helmets every time. And uh, are we trying to identify some sort of app-based way to incentivize this by letting people take a, a photograph of themselves with their helmet and getting some sort of a discount? Uh, we have not done that type of work at this stage, council member. Are we considering it? We haven't at this stage, um, but it's something that we could look into. Uh, again, that's something uh, I would consider. And uh, I know there's technology uh, through sensor use to uh, tell whether uh, uh, bicycles and scooters are being used on the sidewalk. Are we looking at uh, adopting or incentivizing uh, that technology as well? Yes, absolutely. And uh, and again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, some of the companies, and one in particular, has already talked to us about that technology. We actually met with the company that's developing that technology for them, and they are in a space where they are beginning to look at testing it on the actual scooters that are in a part of our program. So um, even at this stage, we're looking to set up meetings and actually test the vehicles out ourselves. So. Our staff, our investigators will go out and take a look at these devices, look at how they work, and then, you know, begin adding them to the fleet and monitoring them so that we could potentially develop a program later on uh, if once we begin to see how they work and if they work. Okay. And uh, have we looked at, even though these are dockless mobility, have we looked at docking areas so they won't be just strewn around to, trying to identify and set up docking areas and giving some sort of small incentive for uh, locating bicycles there. Well, one of the things that our group does, and and, um, and I'll have to give shout out to Jose Elias, who helps us with a lot of this on our staff, is when a council district or, or an area or a neighborhood, they're, you know, they're feeling like they would like to have some type of area where they could maybe potentially establish parking. We do take a look at those zones. I mean, we have to look at a lot of different things, like if it's gonna be on the sidewalk, the sidewalk width has to be the right size and you know how far away from, from different things. But we do take a look at it and we do try to you know establish whether it be a, a corral or even just a drop zone in the area. And what we found is that many people will use these zones. It's, it's not perfect, so uh, please don't, uh, let me have you believe that it eliminates complaints. It doesn't eliminate complaints, but it does add some improvement. And so we often will start there. If we can do it, we will start by adding the zones in the area. And if you know we begin to see the scooter parking more closely related to those areas, then it looks like more of a success for us. And if it doesn't, then we try to think through some other alternatives. So we definitely do take a look at those things. And uh, a number of folks from uh, the operators suggested that we hold off adding new companies uh, until we've had some period of time to uh, assess the changes. And while not necessarily being big fans of the current operators, although some of them have actually done 
some some pretty good work in in uh, uh, altering their operations. I'm wondering whether the the concept of uh, keeping the numbers down until we've uh, had a chance to digest these changes makes sense or not. What what have we done to look at that, and what have we concluded? Well, at this stage, actually, I think we would seek guidance um, from council on something like that. Um, you know, we are in a position where we are opening the city and allowing operators to come as long as they meet certain criteria. Uh, I think the request from the operators, the current operators, has been that those operators who do come in uh, must service other parts of the cities and not the SOZ areas for at least one year before give, being given permission to do to work in SOZs, which are, you know, obviously the most financially viable um, and money-making areas of the city. But again, I don't know, uh, we haven't yet uh, opined uh, on that type of issue and we would look to council for some guidance on that. I would just add yeah. an observation, which is that, um, you know, what we see in the, the world of venture capital funded startups is that uh, female minority owned startups often uh, take longer and have a harder time raising that initial funding. So they are often late entrants to the market. And early on, uh, when council was deliberating on this topic, um, the direction was definitely that we wanted to um, have an open market, encourage competitiveness, and uh, make sure that um, some of those smaller or newer entrants to the market were not going to be unfairly penalized um, because of some of those larger market forces that have to do with who's able to access funding and who isn't. Um, I understand the operators who've been here and they've been putting in time and they've been putting in work, um, but I would be um, hesitant to close the market um, based on those kinds of requests, given what we know about the broader technology landscape. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kretz. Uh, next is Mr. O'Farrell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I want to thank DOT uh, for your comprehensive report. A lot went into this, uh, and it it certainly shows. And so thank you for that. And so thanks for the taking the time to work with uh, the operators and community stakeholders and uh, the various uh, offices. Uh, it's a very informed comprehensive report, so we really appreciate all the work. A uh, couple of questions that I've whittled down a little bit based on the conversation. Um, uh, I have a sense that due to uh, high demand in the special operations zones, I'm, I'm concerned that there will be a rush and a new glut of scooters in them. So uh, how do we, how does DOT plan on making sure this doesn't happen in relation to approving new operators? Well, again, um, you know, it's a citywide program. And so at this stage, we've been encouraging operators to operate throughout the city. Um, and in particular, in our EF, MDD, and MDD areas. So part of what we do expect to happen is that when an operator comes and says, I want to work in the busiest parts of the city where I think I'll make the most money, we're going to say, that's great. But in order to do that, you must also operate in these other parts of the city that may not be as lucrative to you, but we want to encourage ridership and deployment in those areas. And so we absolutely, you know, fundamentally we'd be pushing that type of operation along with requiring operators to work with community-based organizations so that we can develop for the future even better programs. Because right now, again, we're starting this program and perhaps a year from now we may decide that it, you know there's a better way to do this, but we want to do that in partnership with our community-based organizations to make something better. What I'm concerned about though is that it'll just turn into this dog-eat-dog -dog, uh, based on survival of the fittest, are, are you just going to let the market sort itself out with that? Because I, I think that people are going to just, or operators are just going to rush uh, to come to Hollywood. And um, my concern is that we're going to end up with piles of discarded scooters again, like we did when this was sort of the Wild West. Uh, so I, I just think that's a, a something to really watch out for if there's no limit if not imposing some sort of limit at all um, in in these zones, um, I, I think it's just something to look out for. Council member, I, I hear you, and I would just want to clarify that one of the things that we are 
Um, one of the things we do in those special op zones is create limits that are ground truthed in common sense measurements of what a sidewalk or a street can accommodate in terms of overall numbers of, of scooters. And I hope that we can continue to demonstrate that um, keeping the pedestrian right of way clear and treating it, treating people with dignity, making sure that people feel like they can access their sidewalks and get where they need to go is a very high priority for us. And we will continue to behave that way as the, as the regulating body. Thank you. I mean, you all will have the data to tell if yes. it goes from, you know, several hundred scooters in one operation, special operation zone to 2000, you know, within a, a matter of months, we'll be able to tell and then um, work with our office or work with the offices on mitigating that as it comes up, which kind of brings me on as to my next question. This is envisioned to be a permanent program, right? Uh, for evaluation for possible changes. Do we anticipate on when, when those intervals will be for evaluations or will they, or we let this sort of organically guide us? I think we are open to direction from council. I mean, we would be happy to come back on an annual basis with a report back um, and, and build up a cadence so that, you know, you, you do get a chance to see for yourselves and we can be transparent about how the, how the, the program is performing and whether or not there are specific requests like new technology around sidewalk riding, gyro, uh, riding or gyroscopes or whatever else comes next that we, white, we might present to you for your deliberation and inclusion in the program. Thank you. And based on the pilot program from a few years back, um, are there any updates to the insurance requirements or policies since we're rolling this out citywide? We have not made any updates to the insurance uh, at this time. Okay, so the operators carry their insurance uh, that that carries to their customers. Uh, automobiles that might get crashed into or damaged from scooters crashing into them, uh, they're just liable for their own insurance that they happen to carry. So we're we're not uh, leaning in uh, on that issue either way. It sounds like um, this is no judgment. I'm just for clarification. You know, I think I'll just give you my um, honest assessment was that those insurance and liability requirements seemed of particular interest to the council last time around and they were actually raised um, from what we brought in and so based on the we didn't get any guidance to revisit them so we've we've sort of deferred to council's direction on that on that item um, so that's not something necessarily that the department is putting forward as as a strong recommendation it's just a, a deference to council all right something else that we all need to uh, keep in mind then um so the the only complaints that have uh, surfaced in numbers in my office have been in relation to schools right so are there any requirements around schools as far as proliferation um or ingress egress to, to so, for um, large numbers of, of school kids or youth coming or going uh, near a school or into a school building? You know, at this time, we have not set any policies related to that, but that is absolutely, I think, a conversation that we could have, um, you know, so to the extent that there's, if that, that that's been an issue, uh, we could definitely like, take a look at it and address it. Okay, something else to watch out for, thank you. And then um, regarding the low-income program, are there basic, and, and what are they if there are, just basic and uniform requirements applicable to all operators for these low-income programs? It sounds like there might be some flexibility um, baked into them based on operator, but what, what are the city's universal requirements across the board for these low-income programs? Well, we've required the, the operators to have a cash option uh, for their programs. And th again, that's one of the things that we want to begin pushing out uh, with the help of the CBOs, which is because what we saw, we felt last time was a lack of marketing of those programs. So uh, many people didn't know that they even existed. And one of the things that we're going to be re asking the operators to do is to increase their marketing of their programs um, and 
to ensure that that gets out. But beyond that, at this stage, what they've done is they've showed us what their programs are. And to the extent that we feel that it doesn't go far enough, we absolutely can, you know, make a decision about what, you know, what can and should happen with their programs. But we have allowed them to have some flexibility based upon their operations. And will DOT be, uh, you mentioned monitoring. Will, will there be monitoring in some sort of official way um, in, in that you'll require or you will request or require data to be sent to you in relation to the low income programs or uh, collateral where, where they've demonstrated that they're doing the marketing, et cetera, or will it be on the honor system? Well, we will be requesting, you know, information about, you know, for example, the number of people who signed up for their programs and, and they've, and they are, they've been willing to give us that type of information. We may not seek much more granular information, but we will look at numbers. All right. And I would suggest that, um, the higher those numbers, there, there's an opportunity for greater incentives right there uh, moving forward uh, for, for all the operators. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Great. The next hand up that I saw was Mr. Buscano, then followed by Mr. De Leon. Mr. Buscano. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Bloomfield, um, and thanks, um, Chair Bonden, for uh, putting us together on this um, this effort to um, advance equity on um, um, demand mobility program. I want to first thank the department and echo Mr. Bonin's words, say thank you for really taking this time and doing the due diligence to redraw the equity zone maps that we've had before us. In my opinion, this is the most critical and most important aspect of the proposed on-demand mobility program. It's just wasn't hitting the mark and here we are today. And I heard from great, great things from operators and how they work closely and, and engaged in the past several months um, while the department drafted the report before us. I know it was an easy task, but I want to thank um, Ms. Reynolds and her department for considering all options by uh, creating this incentive zone map and structure that makes more sense for the communities in the city of LA. A uh, question about well, the, the, the prospects. What are the, the prospects of expanding the equity focused mobility development areas over time? What sort of plan is in place? Uh, to get the infrastructure up to speed in the um, standard permitted districts and uh, what's that timeline look like? Um, where would funds come from and have these plans already been worked uh, into um, the department's strategic plan or will the revisions uh, still need to be made? So I'll um, give it a swing and then let Jarvis uh, back clean up. So the um, First of all, to your first question about whether or not we would evolve them over time, uh, I would just confirm that might be a good uh, something for us to make sure we incl include in any annual report. And I do believe um, Council Member O'Farrell asked, and I had just forgotten that y'all actually directed us in August to bring forward annual reports. So we can do that and make sure that we are including uh, for consideration those um, the the both the, all, all the zones. You know, it, we're going to need to re revisit them on a regular basis and make sure they still make sense. And then your question about infrastructure uh, is a good one. So in round one, uh, we looked at where we saw the highest ridership and the greatest density of crashes where there was no infrastructure. And we used um, revenues from the program to install the protected bike lane on 7th and the extension of the protected bike lane on Figueroa in downtown that we just that we just finished. So I would anticipate we, we did include in the program's budget um, a line item for infrastructure because that's something else we heard from the operators. If they want to see more people riding, they know that the key to that is having safe places to ride. Right. I think that that would be something that we would do on a regular cadence as well on an annual basis. Look at using those fees to go in and, and upgrade the infrastructure where we see the need, um, and it's certainly something that we have uh, citywide. We have a goal in our strategic plan to expand um, all the the bikeway network, <laughs> the uh, improved pedestrian safety, the transit only lane uh, network, and then as well as continuing to do these large transformational um, high cost projects like uh, my fig, which was you know forty million dollar project. Um, or Avalon, that's another one that's a, a long project, reaches into your district and the others um, that requires real concrete transformation. 
So we're we're trying to hit all of those things in the strat plan. Jarvis, you want to add or? Yeah, <clears throat> um, just echoing uh, what Ms. Reynolds has mentioned. You know, we absolutely plan to revisit. One of the things you have to do in a regulatory space is to be is to be nimble and to be able to understand changes, uh, especially demographically. And one of the great things about Los Angeles is that it's a dynamic city. And so it's not static. And one of the things that is coming, I know later this year is new census data. And so as new census data comes out, you know, those are things that we use for these maps. And so we will definitely be taking a look as data transitions over time into how that matches into the current maps and what may or may not need to be changed based upon that. Uh, right now it's too early to tell, but we would be doing that on a regular basis. Thanks for that, Jarvis. Um, and, and then just go back to the infrastructure piece. I, I know it, if we want to incentivize folks to use micro mobility options, they want to feel safe at all times. And there's, and there's, I remember visiting Salt Lake City and, and just the uh, the dedicated bike lane. I mean, what felt I had my kids with me, and they felt comfortable riding their bikes as long as it was that uh, the dedicated uh, separation between thirty thousand pound car vehicle and, and, and the bike that you're riding and hoping to, to see the expansion citywide on that. Um, many of us, as, as you even heard, want to um, also contribute to Mr. O'Farrell's comments that, you know, they're hoping that uh, the, the new equity zone maps and incentives will, will create more micro mobility opportunities for these communities. And that obviously is a goal. Uh, if we continue to miss that mark, there'll be room um, or we want to make sure that there will be room for improvement. So can we check in? I know uh, Mr. O'Farrell brought this up, uh, checking in for six months, but uh, Ms. Reynolds mentioned, so that you said annual report. Um, I don't know, is it six months, I'll, I'll leave that up to the chairs to, to decide, um, but a, able to, to check in to, to collect data on the proposed permanent program. So I, I remember just so that I can understand clearly where you're coming from, you want that check-in to make sure that the deployment's happening in Correct. the zones. That's what you're after. And Correct, yes. mean that we come back with maybe not change, maybe changes to the geography, but probably more about changes to the requirements and the incentives and the, whether or not we get that mix right. And I would. Yeah, going back to the whole, uh, yes, you know, understanding that knowledge is power, power knowledge is power. Gotcha. And uh, is the more information and data that we have, we want to make sure that um, those in the disadvantaged um, communities are, are um, being serviced as well. And then a timeline on the uh, on-demand mobility rules and guidelines. Uh, I know this report, the Ju July 2020 report included the attachment, but for clarity's sake, we wanna make sure that um, we're expecting a final version to be uploaded. When can we expect that? Um, I think we can expect that uh, very soon. Um, so it's just a matter of once we learn, you know, what the what we have here, then we'll be putting that together in the rules and guidelines and submitting it uh, right away. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Great, thank you, Mr. Piscato. And, and certainly as uh, committees, we can we can request updates at any time. Um, we have the annual one going, but we certainly, uh, neither Mr. Bonner nor I are, are shy about doing that. So we, we definitely, if any member of these committees wants an update, we'll schedule it for sure. Um, thank you. Uh, Mr. DeLeon. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, um, as well as the chair of the Transportation Committee, Mike Bonin, and uh, my colleagues, uh, Joe Buscaino, uh, Mitch Farrell, and, and, and Mr. Koretz, uh, for their line of questions. I think it's uh, really important. Um, um, hi, Salida. It's nice to see you again. Uh, um, a couple things. One is, um, unlike many other neighborhoods that, that have their boundaries and the neighborhoods within downtown LA all blend together. So from looking at the map provided in the report, it appears that downtown LA is split into potential all four operating districts. Can you guys elaborate a little on why that is? Yeah, so you know what we found in the district, I mean, Again, downtown is a dynamic area, which has, you know, some economic hardships in parts of it um, and not in others, but also has infrastructure in place for ridership to happen. And so and, and also what downtown also has is, a, is quite a bit of ridership in particular areas. And so 
one of the things we're going to attempt to manage there is, you know, while we may want to push deployment in some parts of downtown, we also are looking at creating a special operations zone in parts of downtown because there is a great deal of ridership. And one of the things that we do look at when we're putting together a special operations zone is, you know, how much management is required uh, of a particular area. And so um, there are parts of downtown that absolutely have the, the ridership where, you know, that requires us to be out there a lot more uh, in order to ensure, um, you know, proper usage. So the reason why it has all of those things is because it, it is, you know, for lack of a better term, all of those things. And, um, but we will do our best to make sure that we can manage it properly. Uh, May I just you. add, you know, we, we know that um, council offices and their staff know the constituents in their, their, their neighborhoods best. Um, you know, and so occasionally, you know, we can, we can work closely with you, especially for a special operations zone to make sure that uh, we get that boundary um, to a place where it makes sense and where it's going to work for folks. And then something that, you know, we, we don't want to make major modifications because we want there to be predictability for the operators. Um, but that is something that we can um, modify over time as well. And uh, it's a salute or, or, or Jarvis. Um, what, what stakeholder uh, outreach have you, you all conducted uh, to the downtown, you know, stakeholders about the proposed, you know, division into the uh, four operating districts? Well, we've done a lot of surveys, I mean, related to public ridership. And, and again, a lot of the data that was looked into, um, you know, were, was data related to what's happening on the ground in those areas. And so, you know, that's what helped to dictate the boundaries. The boundaries were really more based upon neighborhood council districts. Um, so again, you know, what we didn't want to do is have this like only three blocks for an EF MDD. We, we focused more on the actual district, the council district itself. Uh, so that, because that actually made more sense for people on the ground, um, not just users, but also the operators themselves. So we really focused on that. So that's why you may see it, you know, well, you know, you may see it, if you're walking down the street, you may feel one way about it, but it would expand for the entire neighborhood council district. What I'd say is, um, uh, and, and I think you're much, you know, Jarvis uh, for that, um, to, to Salita's point, um, a few moments ago, um, if I could have DOT definitely work um, and, and, and Jarvis uh, with uh, uh, my staff members um, who geographically cover uh, that specific area in, in downtown Los Angeles. You're absolutely right, Jarvis. It's a, it's a very dynamic, you know, uh, area and, you know, sort of between the haves and the have nots and sort of kind of uh, euphemistically the have nots, the skid row, the largest unhoused community member you know, uh, community in, in, in the United States and obviously the financial district and, you know, Staples and, and Bunker Hill and so forth. But uh, definitely uh, uh, like uh, uh, DOT staff to work closely with my office, uh, obviously the operators and downtown stakeholders uh, in terms of the special operations zones in the next few months. So we can work out a system that, that's efficient and obviously uh, that works for operators uh, and just as importantly, uh, if not even more importantly, with uh, the downtown stakeholders. So uh, to your point, the original point that you brought up, uh, Selena, I appreciate that very much. So uh, through the chairs, uh, Mr. Blumenfield and, and, and Mr. Bonin, just a couple more uh, questions I have. One is on, uh, I, I know a lot of folks, Mr. Busca, you know, Mr. O'Farrell um, and, uh, uh, Mr. Bloomfield, Chair uh, Bloomfield, as well as Mr. Monin did touch upon the issue um, uh, on the issue of, of equity. Um, the the proposed plan discusses having vendors uh, working with community-based organizations, the CBOs, and the equity-focused mobility development uh, districts. I'm glad uh, to see that we're asking folks to work with the local CBOs. I'm wondering how we will ensure that the operators work well with the CBOs and uh, that the nonprofits are in fact fairly paid uh, for their services. Can can you elaborate, you know, a little on that? Um, uh, the reason why I say this is, you know, we're going beyond algorithms now and we're talking about human beings. We're talking about, you know, uh, community-based organizations that are historically uh, and geographically in areas that have not been well served. Obviously, you know, folks have made, you know, market-based decisions based on their research. That's why, 
you know, in Bull Heights and South LA. And that's why we don't have Whole Foods. And that's why we don't have Gelsons. And that's why we don't have, you know, Sprouts, you know, that have been market-based research decisions that have been made, you know. Uh, prior to that, it's called redlining and so forth, right? So, you know, uh, beyond the algorithms, you know, and uh, everything that Silicon Valley has to offer us that either makes life better for us or actually makes life worse for us, you know, a combination thereof, you know, can you guys elaborate with that with regards to the operators and the CBOs? Yeah, so <clears throat> as we, as the CBOs get more involved, uh, because right now, you know, we haven't been able to deal with them nearly as much as we would like to. But as they get involved, we are basically going to be monitoring what's happening for them on their end as well as what's happening on the operator end. So what that means to us is, you know, we'd have to do check-ins essentially with the CBOs to ensure that they're getting what they need out of this partnership. And, and also, you know, what are their goals? So this isn't the kind of thing where we're going to take a fully hands-off approach. We're actually going to be uh, more hands-on in terms of, you know, what's the right approach for your neighborhood? What's, what are the things you're looking for in this area? Uh, what are the things that you're asking for? And how can we, as you know, the permitting body, the compliance body, the regulated body, assist you know, in guiding this along? And that's really what we expect to do. So you're right, that goes beyond uh, the algorithms. That's gonna be a lot more you know, face-to-face, you know, reaching out, what kind of interactions do you need? What, you know, what's gonna be helpful for your area? But we do expect to be doing that as part of our program. Uh, once it gets on its way, we will be checking in with the CBOs. Uh, and, and even to the extent if it's a CBO we're not familiar with, we would likely be vetting that CEO, that CBO with, with the council district and saying, hey, you know, we're not familiar with this, com- this organization, you know, and working with your, with your council members and, and your staff on, you know, what's the right fix in that area. Well, thank you, Jarvis. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to, to, to hear that, you know, very much so. And, and, and when in doubt, you know, by all means, please, you know, check in, you know, with uh, the staff of the, of the respective council members, you know, uh, who represent uh, areas uh, of, 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 of great need um, or with, with us, you know, uh, directly. Uh, lastly, I'll say, you know, to the chairs, you know, uh, Bloom and Phil and Vaughn and well, well, I know that, you know, today's report, you know, focus on equity zones and, 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 and fares. One of the biggest concerns we hear about, obviously, and I know Mr. Koretz is, is how scooters end up and, and all over the sidewalks, you know, dealing with ADA issues and, you know, in, in short, creating a nuisance. Let me be very clear and, 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 and direct with everybody. I, I, I do support, you know, obviously uh, different modes of transportation. I think scooters, you know, with regards to reducing our carbon footprint and getting folks out of, you know, uh, 30,000, you know, pound, you know, vehicles and not emitting carbon dioxide or, or carbon dioxide equivalent is a good thing. It's how we do the, the regulatory framework. But in this case, obviously, as we sort of democratize accessibility, if you will, to these types of uh, modes of transportation, uh, particularly in, in low-income you know, neighborhoods, you know, I, I can already foresee all the phone calls to for folks who are going to be complaining you know, about uh, all of the uh, 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 the scooters are ending up on all over the sidewalks. Uh, uh, my, my mindful, I just want to say to all the folks that lift in Lyme and, and everyone else I'm supportive, you know, but I understand that, that, that all of you um, at uh, uh, LA uh, DOT specifically um, and the operators have made attempts to fix this issue, but especially now that the scooters are being encouraged to be deployed in the disadvantaged uh, communities, Again, we're going to see a, a pro- proliferation of scooter, scooters. I'm worried about how we're going to address this plan. Um, elaborate. What, what plans do you have to, have to address this issue? I'll start by just saying that we agree with you, and that was something that we tracked really closely and held operators accountable for correcting um, during the initial pilot was their responsiveness to um, complaints of, of uh, clutter on the sidewalk. Sidewalk clutter was far and away, uh, you know, the main concern uh. from residents, from council offices. And so we tried that really closely. But when we looked around, you know, that approach is uh, limited by the number of people who are willing to call 311 or to, to make a complaint. Um, and so we've been uh, continuing to encourage the industry to improve its own technology. And I think some of these um, companies are even working on scooters that 
um, you know, can write themselves and potentially even uh, roll to a, um, you know, a docking zone or someplace else where the city has designated that they need to, they need to be. Those technologies, as well as gyroscopes and other things of that nature, even the um, technology designed to identify and prevent sidewalk writing are still somewhat nascent. So um, we, you know, in the programs where they've had the greatest success in eliminating sidewalk clutter, uh, I think San Francisco's is probably far and away the, 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 the best example. It's because they have required a lock to device and they have infrastructure in place for people to park the scooters. It's as simple as that. So yeah. continue, uh, we are going to, you know, bring an infrastructure plan forward that maybe will give the council some confidence that it's fair to require a lock to device. And, and at the same time, as I continue to hear from all of you, a great deal of interest in some of these other technologies um, that might uh, eliminate or reduce the sidewalk clutter issue. And we will continue to include those in, in any and all reports that we have. But believe me that when I say that, um, you know, I will consider this program a success when we are no longer talking about sidewalk clutter and we've moved on to some other issue with the, the program, but that one is, is front of mind for me. Um, in particular, because the department is, you know, one of the co-chairs of Vision Zero, and and having a safe um, sidewalk to walk on is is a primary concern for us. Yeah, no, thank you, Selena. I think, uh, ironically speaking, if we have a lot of clutter, especially in um, our greatest needs uh, neighborhoods, it shows that the deployment is working. But you know, needs we just need a uh, 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 a framework uh, uh, to make sure that uh, we can, you know, just all the, the scooters in a in a very safe uh, easily accessible manner where uh, complaints will hopefully be minimal and, and folks won't be you know blowing up our telephones because all of a sudden because of the new deployment the other lot of unintended consequences now now we have everyone you know um, you know crawling up the walls because of uh, uh, the scooters um, Jasper I'm encouraged uh, about what you said um, I, I'd like specifically from you a, a report back within six months from DOT that details how the new process will work, especially a report on the partnerships with the CBOs and the equity focus, mobility, yada, yada, whatever it is, as, 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 as we deal with this. And and lastly, you know, through the chairs, the last thing I'd say is um, I'd like to, if it's, if this is the appropriate time, you know, uh, Mr. Bloomfield, uh, uh, make a, 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 a amended recommendation to number three, which is to ask DOT to to, to report back to council with a, a, a parking uh, infrastructure plan that that can allow for uh, effective limit implementation to what Salida was just mentioning a moment ago, uh, the locked device uh, requirement as as we and, and as you know other technologies uh, or systems that can best address uh, the scooter parking. Um, if we can do this, you know, and do this correctly, it, it just becomes a win-win situation. I think for the operators, for the stakeholders, and how we just started to we change culture and, and, and get folks using this and, and with high frequency, obviously, you know, everyone's going to win on this, but we need this in an orderly fashion so we don't have them scattered. So if uh, you tell me the appropriate time, if this is the time, Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll follow your lead. Great. Thank you. No, I'll, uh, I hear you and I will include that as, as when we go through the proposed amendments at the end. I just made a note Thank of it. We'll, we'll, we'll do that. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, Mr. Koretz. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I just have one other area of question, which is uh, relating to cost to the city. Um, I'm assuming we're, we're willing to uh, uh, partially fund this program because we're assuming it's of value in terms of providing first and last mile, first and last mile or direct to destination travel. But have we ever done any kind of a survey or do we have any idea how many people actually use it for that and how many people just use it as a, a joy ride? Um, first, I, I do want to reiterate that this is actually a cost recovery program. So uh, the fees from the program that the providers will be paying, uh, you know, and this is part of what's before you, it's a $20,000 administration fee for each provider, as well as a trip fee, those fees and that, that money go to fund the cost of the program. So. Um, we're not, uh, I guess, divvying out any additional money for the program to operate. Uh, it is a full cost recovery program, oh. and, to the, and so, um, and we will. And the things that are a part of the program include uh, 
money set aside for infrastructure and enforcement and, and things of that nature. So um, I just want to be clear um, that, that's, that that's how we're managing the program. It's full cost recovery. Well, that answers most of my question, but I would ask, ask uh, the initial part uh, still, which is, do we have any idea how many people actually use it for critical transit and how many people use it for joy rides that they just wouldn't be taking if they didn't exist? Uh, we don't have that data at this time, no. Council Member, we're happy to provide you the um, year one report, though. We do have a tremendous amount of information on all of the sort of trip making characteristics. Um, to get the level of insight that you're after, um, we would have need to, needed to be able to do um, individual surveys, but I think we have some information on whether or not, um, we, I think we might have asked a question about uh, if you know, scooters and bikes didn't exist, um, how would you have made this trip? And one of the, the choices in that survey question is usually, um, I just wouldn't have made the trip. So you might be able to derive some insight from that, but that's exactly what you're asking. Um, so we can we can pull that together and give you the, the, highlight the relevant part that might begin to address your question and take that into consideration for future um, evaluations that we conduct. I think that would be very helpful. So uh, I appreciate that offer. Great, thank you, Mr. Chris. Uh, I wanted to drill down a little bit on the, uh, most of the amendments I think I have down, but on the one Mr. Bonin put forward, uh, and I'll, I'll first do it by asking a question. As I understand it, Mr. Bonin, you, you wanted to increase the deployment to um, to 20% from the 5% requirement to in the equity focused mobility development districts. And what I want to, and, and I'm very open to that, uh, but what I wonder is as we increase from 5%, should part of that capacity go to the mobility zones? Uh, and I don't, I, I'm really asking this as a open question. I'm not, it seems that we do want to incentivize that as well. And so I'll, I'll first throw it to Salita to, to sort of get your thoughts on whether or not there should be some portion of the increased percentage. And then uh, Mr. Bond, I really want to hear, I, I do want to take your lead on this, want to hear what you're thinking on that. But that's just a thought that occurred to me because we are trying to incentivize the equity zone for sure. And, but to some extent, the mobility zone as well. Ms. Reynolds, what are your thoughts on allowing some of that capacity? Yeah, I would, if it, uh, you know, I, I would recommend if we're going to begin to look at increases in some of those other zones, um, some consideration for both the, you know, we're, we're those mobility um, disadvantaged zones and the equity uh, with the equity overlay. One is just a measurement of um, where, you know, there's infrastructure there and, and using um, these kinds of things for short trips would make sense, but it just isn't happening. And so we're hoping to move the needle on that um, through availability, visibility, and consistency of the, the fleet itself. And then the other is really aimed at making sure that lack of transportation doesn't um, inhibit you from being able to, to get access to opportunity. So they're really, you know, one I would say is almost more of a pure um, sustainability or, or climate focus. And the other one has climate justice as well as racial justice, and mobility justice included. Um, I think they are um, equally urgent um, and I think they, you know, it's, it's hard to do one without doing the other at the same time. So from my perspective, I, I you know, would, it, would um, envision that it would make sense to increase both of them if we're, if we're headed in that direction. Um, but having said all that, uh, this is just me thinking out loud right now. It's, it's not a deeply considered policy position. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we could make the adjustment that Councilmember Bonin recommends and then you know, include that in maybe a shorter sprint report back um, to see how it's going and whether or not there's, you know, how, how those how those uh, percentages are really playing out. One of the things, the, the real one of the lessons learned um, from the the pandemic and uh, from the department's perspective is that um, all parts of the city don't want the same things. And sometimes, particularly when we had a program, for example, um, slow streets. Um, that program, uh, you know, we, we did a lot of work to make sure that we included that program equitably across the city and made extra investments. Um, but in some of the low-income neighborhoods in the city, that's just not what they want from government right now. Um, and so we were attentive to that and, and tried to make sure that we were 
um, being responsive to what we were hearing. So I think we have to go into any kind of, uh, of program like this with a lot of curiosity and open mind and really a posture of humble listening to the people who actually live in those those districts and what they really want and need, um, which is why that requirement for working with CBOs is included to try and ground whatever uh, program elements exist in some of those communities in in a, a, you know a way that is authentic and, and responsive to what um, those com those communities really need. Great, thank you. And, and Mr. Bonin, didn't mean to put you on the spot, but I would love to to get your sense in terms of. Uh, some of that capacity, it's your, it's your amendment, but whether it would make sense to allow some of that n increased capacity to go to the mobility zone? Uh, you know, it, it makes sense when, when you first say it, but actually when I drill down, I'm actually not all that wild about it, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, uh, there are a lot of uh, mobility zones that, that, that really don't have the same need and aren't going to be met with the same reluctance from these companies. Uh, and then there are some which there, there are MDDs which are, are, are in or adjacent to uh, special impact areas. So one of the, the mobility districts is in Venice. And if you allow these companies to count uh, uh, towards that, you're, you ain't going to see it in CD3, you ain't going to see it in, in, in CD15, you're going to see them all uh, uh, in Venice again. Uh, and so part of it is to I'm trying to use the fact that they want to be in the the, the, the high impact zones, the special impact zones, as as sort of a, a cudgel for them. You want to operate in, in the places where you think you're going to make a lot of money. You got to operate in the, the places that are underserved. So that was sort of my my thinking behind it. I don't know if, if Ms. Reynolds has a has a potential workaround for that, maybe. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm also feeling as though. Um, you know, my um, spidey sense is tingling a little bit and uh, knowing some of the some of the operators that were requesting this, I have a feeling that there's some sense in the that community that um, increasing the requirement in some of those those um, those zones would be good for large operators, but harder for small operators. And I think that might be because some of them are somewhat far flung and it requires an additional investment in operations. It's like it makes your your whole operation more expensive because you have to pay for more people to go out um, and move these things around and clean them up, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I I would in general agree with you, council member, that um, what we I don't want to do is repeat the same mistake that we made the first time around, where yeah. and, uh, and I get the, the outcome it, that we wanted because we didn't design the incentives correctly. And I get that that may have a difference for some of the big operators versus the small operators. I, I'd say on that two things. One is my, my, my sympathy is much more for the underserved communities than for the small operators, because we're not talking yeah. mom and pops. There, there, there's not some uh, mom and pop uh, in Mar Vista or Woodland Hills or Wilmington that's sitting sure. there putting together scooters in their backyard. I mean, even the, I mean, there's, there's money behind these companies no matter what. Yeah. Well, I'm hopeful that when, with um, uh, the, the committee, the joint committee's uh, recommendation that we increase the overall cap, um, that, you know, maybe that helps as well, um, you know, with the just sheer numbers. I mean, I think there's a, there's a general, um, theme here that uh, people people don't use these things if they don't see them. There's a certain amount of visibility that is an ingredient to their success. Um, and I know they want to have that visibility in certain parts of the city. And we want to make sure the visibility is definitely the same in other parts of the city. Um, so I, I think that could be, um, I, I take your point um, and, and would say, you know, it, it, it's worth it's worth a try. Uh, especially if we're increasing the cap um, to increase that that requirement, and then you know, as we have been, continue to report back and adjust along the way if, if needed. Yeah, I'd, I'd recommend sticking with the, the the equity zones, and then at six months reevaluate to see if there's a need for the investment in the MDDs. I second agree with Mike. Uh, I'm good with that. I think maybe we add in a report back about. Uh, whether some some of the incentives can go into the mobility zone, but we kind of play it out a little bit because I, I certainly agree with the, the the priority of just thinking about these other zones, which I have in my district and a lot of us do that that do also deserve some sort of incentive, and and we are increasing the capacity. So I'm comfortable with with that, which it sounds like where most of us might.
be willing to lend. So let me, um, I think I've heard, I'm going to go through the amendments that I believe I heard from members and, um, but obviously members correct me and add things if I have not captured what you have said. Um, so what we would do, what, what I would suggest is that we approve the re recommendations in the LADOT report dated March 9th, 2021 with the following amendments. And I'll list them all. And obviously if I've missed something, let me know it. Or if, if you wish to, that we pull one out for a separate vote, let me know that as well. Uh, otherwise we can take them all on bonk if, uh, if folks are game. So first was to the, the amendments to increase the vehicle cap to 6,000. Second amendment was to require operators deployed in the SOZs to deploy 20%, which is an increase from 5% of their fleet in equity focused mobility development districts. Uh, and then to that, we'll add the um, report back on whether some, some can go in the mobility zones in the future. Uh, amend number that the other one is amend number three to add consideration of alternative technologies to reduce sidewalk clutter. Is also an amendment to direct LADOT to report back annually on the status of the program with an emphasis on deployment in equity zones. Um, then there was report back on the feasibility of adding incentives. Well, we, I already mentioned that one. And then direct LADOT to report back in six months with an evaluation of community-based organizations and transportation management organization partnerships. Um, does that, did I miss anybody's amendments? Okay, did I capture them accurately? Mr. Kretz. Yeah, I, I would uh, would add maybe when we come back with, with a six month report to uh, evaluate incentivizing all technologies that we have not thus far incentivizing for safety purposes. Um, I would also uh, uh, just comment that I have some concerns about whether the 20% equity focus may make these companies uh, more difficult to pencil out. Um, I'm not overly concerned from my perspective because if they all went broke, I would not complain. <laughs> I'd probably be happier. But uh, just offering my, my point of view that they may struggle if uh, they put out 20% of their vehicles in areas where they're underutilized. See, even so, when I do something that will get you the result you want, you still <laughs> the opposite side of me on this issue. Well, I'm just commenting, Mr. Mr. I, Mr. I, I suspect, Chair. I suspect it won't get the result that, that the committee wants in terms of uh, maximizing the effectiveness of the program. M Mr. Chair, perhaps Mr. Kretz would like to increase it from 20% to 50% to achieve his <laughs> overall goal. Yeah. I would, but for the benefit that. of the whole, I'm not suggesting that. Okay. And, and Mr. Kr and, and, and I, I do think this is a work in progress. And if it's not working, we have the ability to come back and, and alter that rather quickly. But uh, did you want me to take that as a separate vote or are you comfortable with that as part of the package? No, no, no. I think it's fine. I was just offering my observation on it. Uh, if we could make it work at 20%, I think it'll be great. I just have, have some doubts. Okay, any other comments or questions? Uh, so the recommendation again is to approve the recommendation in LADOT report dated March 9th with the amendments that I listed and to adopt the draft ordinance dated March 10th, 2021. So that is, we can do that correct Mr. Esmos, with one vote since there's no objection to grouping them. So yes, if so that- Yes, you like me to read the, um, the roll right now? Then yes, great. If everybody understands what we're voting on, please uh, read the roll or take the vote. Yep. Uh, you're on mute, Mr. Smith. Thank you so much. Wrong, wrong way with the button. Okay, so this is for the Public Works Committee, and this is for Council uh, Council Member Bloomfield. Bloomfield, aye. Council Member Delion. Aye. Council Member O'Farrell. Aye. And Council Member Coretz. Aye. So for the Public Works Committee, this passes. Now this is for the Transportation Committee. Council Member Bonin. Bonin, aye. Council Member Koretz. Aye. And Council Member Buscaino. Aye. This item passes as amended in both committees. Wonderful.
and there's nothing else on the desk. Is that correct? Yes, the desk is clear. Before we close, uh, I want to I want to call out uh, Cecilia Castillo, who's been on my staff for a long time, and this is her last day chairing. Cecilia, can you put your face on, or are you uh, too shy to do that? Uh, all right, maybe she's too shy to do it. But this is her last day. She's done an amazing job with me and my team. There she is. Uh, and we're just so grateful uh, to you and to, to leading this committee. Uh, hopefully the committee will not fall apart once you once you have left. She's, she's leaving the office, but not going that far. She's going to street services. Adele has stolen her uh, in a good way. We'll prove uh, that, Bob. <laughs> so no, she's she's going to be great and i just just thank you for all you've done and just on behalf of the entire committee thank you this well i think i think it's important to acknowledge where she really learned everything okay. uh, oh. in cd 11. oh she did work somewhere before she worked for me i forget where but yeah congrats cecilia we're gonna miss you hey, thank you everybody i appreciate it all right with that this meeting is adjourned thanks everybody